Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Today we have Elena visiting us from, uh, actually she's an intern right now at JPL at NASA, but uh, we actually met when uh, I was in Cambridge and she was also in Cambridge. Uh, she was uh, working at the Bergman Center for Internet and Society and also collaborating with some people in the Center for Civic Media. Uh, and she was a master's student, PhD student at the computer science department at uh, Harvard. Um, so she's gonna talk to us about uh, filter bubble and how to deal with biases on our news consumption. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andres. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be able to present to you some of the work I did in uh, graduate school. Um, so to tell you a little bit more about my background, I just finished my master's in computer science at Harvard with a focus in human-computer interaction. Um, part of the work I did there had to do with um, interfaces um, for behavior change. I've done some work um, in collaboration with the MIT Media Lab, um, which I'm going to present on today. Um, Things I won't talk about, but you should ask me, are work that I did at the Berkman Center, where I worked on Media Cloud, uh, a project that is aggregating over 15,000 um, news and blog sources to make them available uh, to researchers and the, the public. Um, and I'm currently working on interactive data visualizations um, at the Jet Propulsion Lab, where I'm helping um, engineers uh, communicate data better uh, for space missions they're planning. So today I'll be talking about um, the filter bubble and how we can overcome it and how we can think about that from the perspective um, of the user interfaces we are uh, using. Um, the three projects that I'll be presenting are cover three themes. One is content sharing, um, and I'll focus on um, memes shared around a couple of social events and how they reflect filter bubbles. Um, the second part is about content reading um, and how we can design user interfaces um, that encourage us to read more diverse content. And the third is about uh, the way we search um, and how to build better search interfaces. So I mentioned the filter bubble. Um, I'll run with some, uh, some examples uh, from, from the wild. Um, this is an um, image that was trending about a month and a half ago uh, when protests were taking place in Turkey. Uh, so what you're seeing is on the left screen, um, there's a picture of penguins. This was a documentary that was being presented on CNN Turkey. At the same time, the world and CNN world uh, was looking at the protests and the violence in the street. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty big contrast. This is a man-made uh, filter that was imposed on people. Um, no big surprise, penguins really became a symbol of these protests. So when, when I was tracking this uh, story, I thought, let's try to see how, um, what, what happens when I search for this event online. Um, for this purpose, I will use um, image search because it really illustrates the information I was finding. So a lot of the protests were um, around Istanbul and nearby. Um, so I thought you know, I would search for Istanbul and see what kind of results come up. And this was a week after the protests happened. Um, so they were trending in the media. So I get a lot of pictures of tourism and pretty monuments, nothing about the actual news. Um, I thought I would try to be a bit more specific. I'll search for Istanbul and events. Uh, maybe that tells me something. Um, there are a lot of concerts, uh, but still nothing about the violence that was taking place in the streets. I thought I would be more specific, so I looked for Istanbul news. Um, this is start, starting to show uh, the events that were taking place in, on the streets. Um, there are still some fashion shows, um, some, uh, some fishing, but um, there's a majority of pictures that depict the events. And finally, if you knew what to search for, which were the Istanbul protests, um, you would get a lot of images of violence and protests um, um, and what was happening um, in the streets. But 
it's a pretty big contrast between the search that I started with, um, which was Istanbul, uh, and the Istanbul protest search that I should have done because um, that was exactly what the search engine expected me to look for. And the type of results really are very different. Um, so unless I knew what exactly to search for, um, I would be really deprived of a lot of uh, information. Um, and this is a bias of how this current technology is designed and what is expecting from us. Um, but it reflects how we can be stuck in a filter bubble unless we know what information to search for. So throughout my talk, um, I'll be referring at the filter bubble problem um, and how that reflects in the perspective of the social network, of the information we search for, and the information we read. Um, so the first project that I'll talk about um, is a study. It's a study of how people shared memes around a couple of uh, social events. Um, and this is work that I did in collaboration with the Center for Civic Media at uh, the Media Lab. Um, so I tracked how memes are getting shared around um, political event, political crisis that was taking place in Romania. Um, around the marriage equality, um, the equal, red equal sign, and um, the memes that got generated around the Boston Marathon. I'll be talking about the first two in this presentation. So this is where my interest for this started. Um, about a year ago, a political crisis was taking place in Romania. To cut the, the story short, it's um, the pre Romania has a president and a prime minister. Um, they're part of different political parties. Um, the pr prime minister was trying to take down the president and organize the referendum where people had to vote whether to take down the president or not. So um, there was a lot of the discussion that focused around let's support the president or let's support the prime minister. Um, and you can already see kind of the uh, theme in these uh, pictures. The prime minister on the left is depicted in a James Bond uh, suit with a plastic gun. Um, What's written in the corner is, uh, my name is paste, copy paste. Um, this was a theme um, ar around uh, the event because two weeks before this, they discovered that the prime minister had plagiarized his PhD thesis. That, that happens in that part of the world. Um, and the president is a, like a die hard, uh, is in a die hard posture. So everything um, started when I was watching my Facebook feed, where I'm connected to a lot of um, Romanian friends who are there or abroad. And a lot of these pictures would show up in my feed. So if you look at them carefully, you'll notice that all of them are around, they're, they're supporting the president. So it's either uh, the president with the German prime, uh, uh, German counselor, um, Germ associations with the Ger Germany are positive, their associations with the West. Um, they're making fun of the prime minister, copy from Russia, paste to Romania. Associations with Russia are negative, their associations with the East. Um, a lot of making fun of the paste, copy paste uh, issue. Um, the church is also appearing, um, believe without questioning, um, more making fun of the prime minister with Dumb and Dumber. So while I was watching these uh, images, at some point I realized that all of them were about um, let's support the president and let's make fun of the prime minister. There was nothing about let's take down the president in my Facebook feed. And I searched through the history and nothing came up. So I thought, well, how uh, there must be pictures around that. People must be talking about that. So. I thought I would try a different community, and I went to the Romanian branch of Reddit. Uh, and here's what I actually found there. Uh, most of the pictures that I found there were around, let's take down the president. Um, and actually very few were making fun of the prime minister, except for the copy-paste issue, which was just to make fun of. Um, and actually, just as a side note to the type of memes, a lot of them are really based on macros um, that are used on, for memes in the US, which are slightly different than the previous ones. Um, now, what this uh, showed me that was that I really had to go through a lot of effort to get to the other side of the story. If I, wouldn't, like, if I wasn't part of the Reddit community, um, 
I wouldn't see these because they wouldn't appear in my Facebook feed. So I thought I would, um, I would see if that um, um, reflects in other events where memes are shared. Um, so I tried to do the same thing when the red equal sign meme showed up. Um, so first, um, the Human Rights Campaign uh, started an initiative uh, a few months uh, back when they encouraged everyone to change their Facebook picture to an equal sign to uh, support marriage equality. So I thought that's great. I'll track uh, what, uh, what um, like messages and images people share um, in the hope that there would be a discussion thread uh, taking place. Well, I started tracking, but the results were overwhelming. There were thousands of images that got generated um, in this process. Um, and I, I gathered around of thousands of, a thousand of them, but apparently there are many more out there. Um, and millions of people changed their Facebook profile. Um, so I'm just going to pull up. Um, that, uh, can we see this? Um, this set of images, uh, just to illustrate uh, the, the type of things uh, people came up with. Um, so they're actually, uh, a lot of them has been labeled. I labeled them with another annotator to identify the, the type of themes that were um, occurring through this discussion. So there are a lot of artistic manifestations. Uh, there's a lot of food and bacon. Um, there are a lot of cats, of course. Um, there are a lot of places um, and that uh, mark the support for equality. Um, and, and there are other themes uh, that, uh, that ap appear in this, um, in this initiative. But what I started with, I wanted to see what the threads of discussion were. Uh, most of these images reflect one point of view, which is support for marriage equality. And that's an overwhelming set of the images. But not all of them are that way. Um, so these are examples of images that are against um, equality. Um, there are all sorts of variations, including religion, um, not equal sign, babies. Um, but it wasn't easy to get to these because they weren't being shared in my social network. So I'll describe how I got to that. So again, I started with the social filter bubble I was in, which was Facebook and Twitter, where this distribution started. Um, and then I wasn't sure where else to check for these images. Of course, I could go to Reddit again. But a lot of these images were trending. So I looked on the, um, on the search engines um, on Google and Bing. And um, a lot of the images showed up there, there. What was interesting about that was that when I followed where those pictures were directing me, uh, I found other social communities like Reddit um, or Know Your Meme. The Human Rights Campaign uh, had a collection of their favorite memes. Um, Catholic memes had memes that were generated. Um, and what is interesting to observe, for example, is that um, the not equal sign, the, the, the images that were not supporting equality, a lot of them I could find on the Catholic uh, memes website. They were, of course, spread out in other sources, too. Uh, but there was, um, they were more predominant on, on this, in this community. Um, again, this is an example that shows us um, that w in order to find uh, threads of discussion that are different than our own, it really requires a lot of effort. And um, these four communities, um, they're in a way social communities. And unless you're part of them or you make an active effort to check them out, you won't be able to see the content that's being shared there. Also, the search engines are themselves a temporal filter too, because the equal sign memes are still somewhat trending. But if I were to look up the Romanian memes again, um, right now, there's no way to find them, although a year ago, they were trending too. Um, so really, the, the goal of the study um, I mean, part of it was to understand how these memes got shared and um, see how, like, 
we could see the different filter bubbles that are created even around image sharing. Um, and we don't want to see penguins, right, if there are other events taking place. Uh, we want to be able to have access to a broad set of information um, in order to be just society, from the perspective of a societal point of view. So, um, lucky us, nowadays we have a lot of technology that's aggregating information. Um, and we could find information that comes from various sources um, and um, should come from diverse uh, points of view. It's all aggregated in one place. Um, and I'll discuss the challenges that come with having access to this diversity that should take us out of a filter bubble, uh, but there are still issues with it. So the second project that I'm, uh, I'll be talking about um, has to do with how uh, we read content and how even if we have access to diversity, it's still challenging to consume uh, opinions that disagree with ourselves. Um, so in particular, in this study, I'll be looking at um, annotations uh, of opinions. Um, so say you have a comment uh, it, on a forum, on a news aggregator, it could come with all sorts of annotations to it. Um, I'll be looking at the author of this comment and how we can enhance this annotation um, in order to engage people with content. So I'll give you a bit of background on why content consumption uh, can be difficult. Um, there are a lot of studies in social sciences uh, that um, tell us that we, we like to read things that agree with our own opinions. Uh, we tend to discard arguments that are threatening to us. Um, uh, there are studies that found there are a lot of users that are diversity adverse. Um, they are more satisfied with reading things that agree with them. Uh, and there are a lot of studies around annotations, like um, you can perceive information as more informative if it's recommended by a friend. Um, some of uh, the studies that inspired my work um, were from uh, political sciences, like um, Cahan's paper that um, shows that when you present people with two different points of view, when they read a point of view that comes from someone that they like, let's say we like this young man here, uh, and he has similar type of worldviews as we do. Uh, if we don't agree with the content they're presenting, uh, but we agree with the author, it's more likely that we'll perceive this content more positively. Um, so to make this more specific, if we think about the Turkey example, um, and we think of two sides of the story, supporting the Protestants and supporting the state and the police um, as being opposing points of view. Um, and let's say we agree with this young man and uh, his views, but we disagree uh, with the person on the right. Um, and their profile reflects their views. Um, what this theory tells us is um, even if we support the Protestants, if we read an article that talks about the state and in, in support of the state and the police, and it comes from this young man that we re relate to and like, we're more likely to pay attention to this. And um, this is the type of mechanisms that I'll leverage uh, in my experiments. Um, so a couple of examples of profiles that are used online. Um, Twitter makes, uh, if, when you look at a Twitter feed of people you don't follow, it makes um, more obvious uh, how this person relates to people you know. Um, Google News is making um, profiles of their authors more prominent and their Google Plus profile associated with them. Um, this is a somewhat more unusual example. Um, New York Times earlier this year um, I had an article on when the Pope uh, got elected um, and the comments um, of the article uh, show reactions of the people who uh, commented 
and um, whether they were a Catholic or a non-Catholic. Um, and that's because they asked everyone uh, to fill in a form where they submitted their comments that reflected more than just the comment, but also some of their opinions. So um, these type of annotations and profiles are becoming more um, and more prominent everywhere. And everything online has, is starting to have an author attached uh, to it, any uh, piece of information. Um, so based on these findings, um, whoop. Um, the current scenario is that if you go to an information aggregator um, and you see a bunch of articles, some of which you agree with and some of which you don't agree with, um, you'll choose to read um, the articles that support your opinions because that's our natural tendency to do so. Um, and what I'm proposing is to attach um, some annotations to these articles, like um, the profile of an author uh, that has the same views as you, or is similar in certain dimensions with you, um, so that when you go to this aggregator, you will choose based on um, who's presenting the information, which in this case are these three profiles that we agree with, and choose to, that could be a filtering mechanism through which you choose to read content. So as a result, um, the choice won't necessarily be based on the uh, content of the article, and you'll be able to be exposed um, to a point of view that you wouldn't initially uh, through this triggering mechanism. Um, so this is an example of different types of profiles. You can categorize people's views in many ways. It can be political views. Um, you can measure similarity based on where people come from, uh, whether they have the same background as you. Um, this is an example of theory that's used in social sciences, um, cultural theory that I use for my experiments, but that can be generalized to other, um, other dimensions of uh, similarity. Um, and this is an example of how, uh, this is based on how individualistic a person is or how, communi uh, how egalitarian. Uh, and these are just some examples that are being used to illustrate how um, profiles of different people can reflect different types of views. Um, and if this doesn't convince you, um, this is an example of a picture of the same person. Um, um, in different poses that can reflect very different views. Um, so in order to uh, test our hypothesis of how people would interact with content when you attach um, profile information about an author, you need to have some profiles. We can, of course, grab information from Facebook or Google+, but we don't have a lot of control about what the, that information reflects. Um, so I created um, the content that would go in the profiles. Um, it's inspired by um, people's likes and activities. We tend to like a lot of causes, for example, on Facebook. Um, so the profiles that I'll be using reflect uh, charity donations. So. Um, I asked people on, on Mechanical Turk uh, to fill in a form where they would give me their cultural views and the charities they would donate to. Uh, these are all made up, but actually if you look up uh, on Facebook, a lot of these things are organizations and pages that, that exist. Um, and they illustrate very strong opinions, but uh, we'll use this throughout our study. Um, so we constructed these profiles from Mechanical Turkers. Uh, we validated the profiles. Um, so we asked other Mechanical Turkers to look at these um, uh, charity profiles and try to interpret people's views uh, in these cultural measures. Um, and they could do that with almost 80% accuracy. Um, you could also uh, use inference algorithms, um, get a similar accuracy. Um, and I did that because um, we can learn from profiles. Information is so structured, we can infer a lot about people. Um, okay, so what we're basically doing next is uh, picking um, comments um, or news snippets and attaching a profile information 
to these, um, to these opinion pieces. So if we have a user and they have certain views, uh, we'll want to see if when we present them with opinions that they don't necessarily agree with, they'll engage with them because they come from someone who's similar to them. Um, okay. So um, this is a study that I ran and um, actually uh, right before my internship and I'm still analyzing the data where um, um, I picked um, news snippets coming from various social topics uh, like um, gay marriage, climate change, uh, gun control, um, and I used the profiles that I created initially um, and attached an author to each of these snippets. Um, so these authors, half of them have a profile that would agree with the reader and half of them have a profile that would disagree with the reader, mostly because they represent very opposing organization support. So what we're looking at uh, is we're asking people to pick two articles that, are most, uh, that they are mo would like to read more about, uh, and we're measuring click-through rates. Um, and although we haven't, I haven't analyzed this uh, results yet, uh, what uh, I asked people to leave me comments on why they chose, uh, how they make their choices. Um, and there's an overwhelming number of people that say, uh, well, I picked because I agree with the, the organizations uh, that are mentioned in that post. So, I mean, this is an example where we make this information very prominent. Um, but um, this, uh, this is to inform us on how people will make um, choices on what to read uh, based on annotations that we add to the author. Uh, and this is... Um, uh, information that's becoming more and more prominent online. Um, so, I guess a takeaway from this project is that social annotations will affect um, how we choose content and what we, content we choose to read. Um, and we should really understand how these social annotations affect readers, especially as we design um, more and more systems um, that contain a lot of information. Yes. The example where you had all the, the news items that you were showing to people. Yes. Down. Do any of these don't match the, what you would expect? Oh, so in this case, we're using uh, the, the content itself of the news snippet. Uh, I've picked it so that it's someone it's as neutral as possible. So most of them are factual. Somebody did something uh, as opposed to uh, climate change is not real. So most of them try to be factual as opposed to uh, expressing opinions. So basically next I will combine uh, um, snippets of text that have a strong opinion. Mm -hmm. This, like for me, it's, it takes more cognitive load for me to read the sentence and figure what it's about than to glance at the bolded text there. So you might even think of representing it more like a search result where you have the title, you know, and the blur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's actually, I would like to make it more as a like search engine result. Yeah. Oh, by the way, if you ask questions, I will give you a token. So, right. so, what? so. You should catch the token. Do we, do we share? Oh. Um, you didn't get one. You, you can get one too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have more of them. <laughs> um, um, okay. Um, so again, I really um, believe that we should understand how all the information we attach to content uh, affects users. Um, because it really affects what we choose to read and how we perceive that content. So um, we've talked about content sharing um, and how people read content. Um, the third project uh, that I'll be presenting is thinking about how to um, design better search interfaces uh, that encourage better search behavior. Um, so this is a work I've done at uh, the Fuji Xerox, um, the FXPAL, Palo Alto Research Lab, uh, last year. Um, and I presented it at CHI um, earlier this year. So to, um, 
to go back to the Turkey example, um, if we were to look for current events in Turkey, uh, especially a month ago, that event, uh, that event was trending. So um, a lot of people do queries around that. So if you were to type a really short query like Turkey events, um, a lot of results would come up. Um, and you would find, like even in the first results, you could find out what uh, the Turkey events were about. Um, but if you're looking for some information that is less common, um, let's say the woman in red's name, uh, this is also an image that was trending. Um, that is um, a piece of information that's not as common and not trending as much. Um, and it requires a more complex search. So if you were to search again with like woman in red, that would not be uh, enough to give you the correct results. So for, for this type of information, you need to type in a more complex query, let's say like Turkey, woman in red name, and you would find the result. Um, so um, in this type of situations, when you search for more complex, more um, uncommon information, uh, longer queries are actually found to be more effective. Um, but uh, people are really bad at doing that. We're really habituated to type short queries. Um, so um, this project will actually address the challenge of how to get people to type longer queries. Um, and it's really about thinking of some user interface intervention um, that gets people to engage with this behavior. Um, <clears throat> so what we designed was, um, in, in the end, was a dynamic search box where uh, it has a colored halo around it. Um, and as you type in more words, it changes colors from red to blue. Um, and um, this was inspired by, um, it, it was meant to nudge people to type longer. You can think it as a parallel to the password um, indicators of how strong your password is. Um, so we wanted to test how uh, this interface compares to, for example, just telling people, hey, if you type longer queries, um, the search engine will give you better results. Um, so an, an explicit intervention. And we ran several experiments to understand this, um, how people interact and uh, how people behaved when using this dynamic search box, but I'll talk about the first one. Um, so we ran a mechanical Turk experiment um, where uh, people were using um, our own platform where we had a search engine uh, and um, search puzzles that people had to solve and they had to do various queries to find a result. Um, and what we found through the experiment was that people actually, actually typed longer queries because of this nudge. So it was pretty exciting to see that such a simple um, intervention um, got people to engage more um, and change their behavior. And really, this was a very simple manipulation that shows um, how we can change people's uh, behavior, at least in how long of a query they type. Um, what was also really interesting was that when we compare the um, um, user's behavior when they interacted with this dynamic search box uh, with telling them explicitly, hey, type longer queries, it's better. We found an interaction effect. So people will type longer queries with our dynamic search box. They'll type longer, slightly longer queries when you tell them explicitly type longer queries. So they listen. It was almost a significant dependent in the second case too. Uh, but there was a significant interaction between the two. So when we presented people with both stimuli, they actually typed uh, fewer words than when they were presented with each stimuli separated. Um, and that was a bit surprising to us because, um, especially in this case, you would think uh, both stimuli are effective. When you combine them, they'll still be effective. Um, what we hypothesize is that uh, people had a mental model going uh, in of what it meant to type longer queries because we told them that before the task and somehow interacting with this dynamic search box actually threw them off. Um, and 
that's something to research more. But um, I thought this was a really interesting uh, finding. And in particular, it should really make us um, reflect on how to design stimuli in the user interface. Uh, because combining a lot of stimuli um, can really lead to damaging effects um, on the user behavior and lead to them behaving not exactly as we expected. Um, so what, what this research shows is um, really we can, is that we can manipulate the user interface really with, with minor changes and change the, the user behavior dramatically. And we should really reflect about how to do that well. Um, especially as the world is full of content that's coming from so many directions, so many annotations, um, social network cues, and so on. Um, okay. So, um, to, to recap the three projects um, that, that I mentioned, um, I think it's important to think about all these aspects uh, of content consumption and um, content sharing. Um, so what we choose to read um, is not necessarily trivial even if we're, when we're exposed to diversity. Um, what we choose to search for uh, will determine the type of content we get exposed to. Um, and the content sharing reflects like the different type of bubbles that uh, we're in. Um, and, and to do that, I think it's very important to study user behavior um, and understand how they interact with different types of interfaces um, and to try to design interfaces accordingly. I really care about exposing people to diversity uh, and helping them um, understand the information that they're getting in relation to the universe of information out there. Um, but that's not an easy task. Um, um, and I think all these three aspects of uh, content consumption um, really can tie into the filter bubble problem and the type of um, the filters that are created through technologies and through the social filters uh, we've created around ourselves. So um, this is a highlight of the project I wanted to talk to you about. There are a lot of other things I would like to tell you about, like the meme typology around the uh, events that I looked at, um, tools of, for news reporting that um, I've been thinking of, and work that I did at Berkman, um, news influence analysis that I actually did with Ifan over there. Um, so please ask me questions. I have tokens for you. <laughs> And could, could you give a brief summary of the tools of news reporting and what are you using? Oh, um, so for, in terms of tools for news reporting, um, this is very related to uh, work that I've uh, started doing at the MIT Media Lab, where Nathan is also from with Ethan Zuckerman. Um, and there we're discussing a lot about how we can improve news at different levels. Um, so. Um, one thing um, I personally care about deeply is how do you uh, provide tools that help people understand news better. So nowadays if we're um, going to a news site and we read an article about an event that happened a week ago, if we haven't been tracing what's been happening in the last week, it's so hard to get the content, um, like a summary of that content and the realistic understanding of what's being presented in a news article. So I think tools that uh, do a better job at uh, s summarizing and helping people understand content is very important, especially as, um, as news rep reporting sometimes is very factual, um, unless you read opinion pieces that come with their own biases. Um, so um, yeah, one thing I've been uh, thinking about is around um, helping people understand the history of an event. And secondly, I've been looking into how um, we can think about news reporting from countries um, that we know nothing about. Um, so uh, if something is happening in Kenya right now, unless it's being presented in one of the news outlets in the US, it's hard for us to get to that content. A lot of events are starting to, a lot of um, 
places are starting to use social media more, and there are people, for example, on Twitter who are active in foreign countries. Uh, but if you don't know anything about that ecosystem, um, how do you look, how do you ad identify those people? So part of the work that I started doing with um, Nathan a while back was looking into um, identifying uh, people on Twitter who are likely to talk about what's happening in a particular country like Kenya. Uh, so for example, we looked at um, a blog called Global Voices where a lot of uh, people uh, blog internationally about what's happening in their particular countries and they use a lot of social media references. So let's say people in, in Ghana would make references to people who are posting on Twitter in Ghana and what they say. So we build up a, a core of people who are likely to talk about what's happening in Ghana by using uh, for example, this blog that was already curating some content for us. And that generates lists of people who will talk about what's happening in Ghana. So when you need to know about what's happening there, you could use this type of mechanism to s know where to start looking. And that helps you with social media reporting. And so the first one you were talking about was more of the user interface, a way to... The first one, yes. And then the second one was a, was a reporter's tool to be yes. able to actually capture information and be part of the, yes. the, the conversation yes. amongst those people. It's almost similar to the self-selection the, the self selection that you were talking about in the beginning when you were saying that most of your, like your news feed had a certain uh, had bias. A, yeah, certain bias. But, and it's, it's essentially automating that and allowing you to dip into that to be able to understand what's going on in that conversation. Is that right? Yes, yes. That's a great answer. Do I get one of those? Oh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I, I thought that's why you probably asked. Um. <laughs> we can show them those of the work that we do. Oops. 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 I, I think uh, it's gonna, it's paper. We'll get to you. <laughs> so I have a question for a second. <laughs> yes. Yes. So um, we want to increase the uh, engagement with uh, the diverse content. Yeah. Um, however, you choose like to read or to view the articles from different authors where these authors basically you like uh, their profile. But to me that is kind of bias to the authors not try to diverse the content. Yes, that, so choosing to read based on um, authors is biased. But I'm thinking of it in terms of providing you with different filters of looking at the information. So in the New York Times example with comments around uh, the Pope election, um, you could, if all, these, all, those con all those comments were annotated, you could filter on people's opinion, whether they agreed with the new election of the Pope or not. But you could also filter through um, who was uh, writing about it. So the people who are Catholic or the people who are not Catholic. And that, I, I agree with you that that's also, um, it's, it's a filter. Uh, but there, there are people with different backgrounds that have a variety of opinions, and that's just a way to expose you to a different, a different set of information. Uh, so that's how I thought of it. <laughs> so I'm wondering about different strategies you guys used for enhancement of the content search. Uh, in relation to the specificities of the search engines. Like, I don't know, there, yeah, I mean, maybe you can talk about it, but I was just wondering about like some specific things that I, I don't even know. For example, does like do having different proposition matter in, you know, mm -hmm. your search? Because that can make your search long, What doesn't really make it very purposeful, mm -hmm. or even the order of the words, or I don't know, like if you use specific words uh, in comparison to like some general words. So mm -hmm. did you take into consideration these things when you were So we, we did it? not take into consideration those things at all. Um, and we basically built our fake uh, search engine for, for this experiment. Um, in terms of, a, I mean, a, thinking about how to apply these findings to an actual search engine, I don't think just taking this intervention and putting it uh, into the search box uh, will get people to type better queries. Mm -hmm. It might take them to get them to type longer queries for a while. I think the way to go about it is to try to kind of educate people about what it means to type a better query. 
So if you have, so let's say, the intelligence of a search engine that um, can tell that you're not looking for, or you're looking for something more specific, and you should type a longer query, uh, maybe then you could use um, some intervention like this, or you could use a message that makes the user understand why they should type longer queries. Um, and I think that applies to like specifics, like using certain um, like prepositions and things like that. I think people just don't know um, always how, how search engines work. Um, and I think it would be great if we could inform them a bit better about that. And that's, it's tricky how to do that because you don't want to <laughs> impose that on everyone. Um, but I would go around like teaching people what, what their actions mean. I think like what you guys are doing is pretty interesting, like using some sort of game, gamification techniques mm -hmm. and make it colorful and visual. Yeah, so you yeah. actually, other than having the knowledge, like practically you get more involved mm -hmm. and you know see how it works. But I mean, I'm still even confused. Like I use search engines all the time, and I still mm -hmm. don't know how to approach to get like different perspectives or I don't know like specific things that happen. I have to search over yeah. and over and many times, not the right yeah. result. And, and actually, another project we did, I did with the same group, and that's being presented at CIGAR this uh, summer, is to show people previews of, um, so if you're in a search session where, let's say, you're looking for a research paper, and you don't exactly know the name, and you have to do a couple of queries, um, and in each query you get different results, um, we would show people a preview of how novel the results um, they were getting in their current query is. So let's say you get results on, um, let's see, maybe I have this somewhere. Um, to show you an example. Well, um, so you get search results on 10 pages. And uh, most people look only on the first page and at the top uh, results. So we basically build a widget where it would show you how novel the results on each page are. So whether each page uh, was returning results that you hadn't seen before. And by seen, it's like seen on the screen or covered over. Uh, and this type of intervention got people to actually engage with the results from other page, like beyond the first page more and explore the results more because um, they would see this another layer of information that said, Look how many new results you're getting through this query. Um, so this is another type of intervention that we thought of um, in terms of information retrieval interfaces. Um, I think there's a question in the back. So the techniques that you have covered are basically trying to get you to break out of your filter bubble. But I was thinking, is there a way to actually fight the filter bubble altogether at the more basic step? So for example, whenever you add a friend, on Facebook, whether it's possible to find the anti anti pair of that friend. <laughs> Here no, we are. I was I was thinking of your nemesis feed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So whenever you do something, every reaction causes a reaction. Every action causes a reaction. So basically, you would have a balanced feed, and for each thing that you do, you also do something else that. Uh, adds to your other profile, so basically the other view, so that you so get your, your other self. That it's your not your exactly other self yourself. that you should contradict with. Yeah, exactly. So you um, always get a balanced view of everything. Or, yeah. or, or get more of it. More of it, um, at least. I mean, I think it's not uh, easy, especially as we don't necessarily want to attend to a content that's different. Um, I think you can think of user interfaces that do that. Um, I think um, other approaches are like, um, so for example, some of the projects that are taking place at the Center for Civic Media um, make biases more obvious in the news. Um, so they show like, what is the world coverage in New York Times in the past 10 years? And then you notice how little are, or how many articles there are. Um, and by making this um, information more prominent, you can encourage people to actually engage with foreign news more. Um, so I think, um, I think sometimes there's a lot of content out there that, it's a bit of a different take, uh, a lot of content that um, when we, don't, we can't evaluate that content very well because we are, don't have the analytical powers to do so um, and tools that 
show us the biases in the news can also uh, help us engage more with our other self. But if we don't even know that other that the other self exists and we should engage with it, then it's well, a hard I task. The average Joe does not have any idea what the filter bubble is or yeah, what the filter yeah. bubble actually reacts. But he's condemned to be the user of that filter bubble, even if he doesn't know about it. So. Yeah, that was the, then that's what we're trying to do. There was a presentation two weeks ago at ICWSM on this kind of topic. I don't know if maybe you were there. I mean, it was like about how the incentives for companies like Facebook uh, are against right. the, the fighting the filter bubble. Like, exactly. if you start seeing content that you don't like on Facebook, you'll start visiting Facebook less, and that's against their own interest, right? Well, so yeah, they try to favor things that are closer to what you are doing. And you can start from the assumption that you're always tracked online, so that means that. Google, Facebook actually know about what you're searching for, what you're looking for, what your preferences are, what your queries are, all these kind of things that add up to your profile. And then ads can actually be targeted specifically for you, and that's their incentive over there. Right. So, I mean, I think ads are doing a great job at understanding. Uh, so, yeah, well, exactly. not always, but some are, are making a lot of effort in understanding the users. Um, I don't know if successful either. I don't know if this will make it to you. Oh, it will. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so I, the, you, you, um, you put forth the idea that, um, that, that, that uh, the lack of opposing opinions is essentially a problem, and that people yes. need to understand more. Now, I would, I, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that, but I could make the argument that that the whole that there's so much information out there that you're essentially un, uh, unsorting the information, like yes. adversely, and you're putting downward pressure on um, uh, on. Uh, consumer satisfaction, right? So if you're at a news site, you know what you want to read, and if you're saying basically, you're flipping that, saying, okay, here's the stories that you agree with, here's a bunch of stuff you don't care about, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of just saying that it would be almost seem to be like it was you're like baking in a dissatisfier for the sake of whatever, because if like let's say I let's say I support um, uh, um, marriage equality, and then. I'm probably not that interested, really, in necessarily having you put in my face a, a bunch of opinions on the thing that I've fully uh, um, sorted through in my mind and made an opinion on. Does that make sense? And I wonder, yes. like, I wonder if it's what its value is when, when the whole purpose of a of a news website is to filter that day's news and sort it in a way that gives you the opportunity to know what's important that day or what's happened that day, and then pick and choose whatever it is you choose to read. So I actually think that news websites, especially the news organizations that are putting a lot of effort in that are doing that they're doing a good job at that i mean they are summarizing content for you and um, i mean a lot of them want to show you um, a, a re real reflection of the news that are out there but um, one issue that is coming up is that in today's world there's much more information that's being, being created through other sources like social media that represents news where there's no authority um, that can do the fact checking and the verification of the information that's being shared um, to aggregate it for you in a, in a, as an authority. So when you think of that then it's harder to, to make judgments over that content um, and I think there we need to think about different mechanisms to to put that content together because there's a lot of it and it's not summarized and you just interact with some more or less random selection of it um, and I think these type of tools um, can be very useful in that space. And for example New York Times will curate comments for you they choose which comments go with their articles but forums and a lot of other websites can't afford to do that um, and I think there you need other mechanisms to um, to aggregate that content and to inform people where where it's coming from and is your uh, is your research about the idea of, of having having the bubble your your social media bubble essentially upended so that you see more stuff of whatever people are are um, are, are Doing your saying in your uh, in your like your news feed, or does that make sense? That I mean, question? Uh, I'm I'm not sure I understood what you're. Asking. My question is like, are you like, do you do you think that this is something that you would want to do, where you would surface um, opposing views into your news feed, so that you would be you would break that that uh, that social media bubble? Um, in this example, yes, I am talking about surfacing these opposing views. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to be done as a 
like in the future as a hidden manipulation where I'm, I mean, I'm trying to manipulate you to show this information. I think people should be aware that they are getting diversity. Uh, but given that it's hard to engage with diversity, this is a mechanism I'm proposing to manipulate that information. But I think at any time the user should be, should realize what, you know, what's being manipulated on him or her. Um, but yes, that's, that's the context of the current study. Oh, I think uh, there's a question that's been pending it. Yeah. I mean, I was curious about unintended consequences of exposing viewpoints. So kind of back to the nemesis feed idea, um, we know that if you um, expose to a person who really believes in something, the opposite viewpoint, it only increases their belief in the original thing. Yeah. Kind of has the negative <laughs> impact. <laughs> Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, if we just feed content into a feed, are we in fact making the problem worse for a certain group of people who we really want to be helping? Um, which is um, kind of a tough challenge. So it leads me to wonder if there's a layer yes. kind of deeper where it's not just the content that are coming out of these streams, but the reasons why the content's being generated. It's not the output, it's kind of the input yeah. instead. And I, I mean, I, I agree with you. and. Um, you know, I'm not ch trying to change people's opinions. I think they should just be exposed to more diversity. They should be aware of what points of view are out there. And they can make an educate, and I think the ideal case is just to make an educated decision based on viewpoints. Yeah, so I mean, what's kind of the end goal of having people see oh. more viewpoints then? To make better judgments based on seeing the diversity. I can go to yes. Fox News even though I don't, I don't like Fox News, right? But I don't go to Fox News because I don't like them, right? So I think we have the choices. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, to your point, that really what's the really what's mm -hmm. the issue over here? Is it really maybe? I think we need to understand what the audience really wants to, to get. Mm -hmm. And I, but I agree with you that exposing the filtering I, is really important yes. for for me to know that, that it is being filtered. To some extent. So if I want to have a choice, I can change the filter. Yes, that. I mean, people do have that choice. Uh, I think making it easier would be great. And uh, for example, in there are more debate platforms that are being built where, uh, for example, um, people are discussing the voting of a certain proposition, and then you can see the pros and the cons of voting to agree or disagree with a certain like voting option you have. Um, and there you can think about what's the effect of seeing these pros and cons side by side and how um, if, if a user interface makes a difference and how you perceive these points of view where you want to see maybe both uh, perspectives to make a judgment. One last question. Well, I was just thinking about um, sometimes people don't want to hear the opponent. It might be interesting to look at some different scenarios where hearing a diverse opinion is, is really positive, so I was just thinking like a scenario might be local, local events, right? All my friends might be saying they're going to this thing, and then hearing some opinion from something different might just let me go and experience something di mm -hmm. diverse from what all my friends are doing, but it isn't trying to pass judgment or make me feel like you're trying to I mean, I think people might be more open-minded about it because doing either is sort of positive and you're, you're exposing me to diverse things, but it doesn't feel like it's necessarily this versus that. So I was just thinking it might be interesting to look at other um, scenarios. And I, and I almost think maybe more local situations might be more interesting than the hyper-global yeah, things yeah. because like, people do get really biased on things like abortion yeah. or yeah. non-abortion or religion and these kinds of things, and then kind of getting them to change could be a lot harder than something that might feel a little closer. Mm -hmm. that, that's actually the feeling that also I got through <laughs> designing these studies, that it's really hard to get people to, I mean, if we don't want to change people's minds, but have, we have very strong opinions on these issues like religion, and I think somewhere where, um, where it's lighter to make a decision might be a good context to study um, these things. Like elections, like we have an election coming up, and sometimes you don't like, have I don't, a strong opinion. Yeah, you don't like, have I don't know because there's one. so many <laughs> candidates, or like that's you know, like certain initiatives get a lot of press, like the you know, marijuana one. But some of them you read it, and I'm like, I'm trying to figure out like what it means, and you know, like I think like there's still like you know, like I'm always searching the internet trying to figure out like you know, trying to figure out who's for and against it, and you know, what I think about it. But I think it would be useful to have the tool that kind of gave me that more nuanced approach. And sometimes it's not even just negative and positive, like there are different categories and different forms of looking at things and different perspectives that people don't even 
like people are not even aware of those type of you know possible yeah. Yeah. use. I mean, it's it's like things that are happening abroad. If if you don't know they're happening, you can't even search for them because that's just not it's something that's accessible to you. Exactly. You just have the image like, through CNN. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank the speaker. Yeah, thank you.